Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the study of religion and liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. On this episode, we examine Senator Marco Rubio's recent proposals for what he calls common good capitalism. Rubio draws heavily from Catholic social teaching in his defense of common good capitalism, describing an economy for the common good characterized by dignified work and stability for working class families. Earlier in November, Rubio addressed students at the Catholic University of America, saying, quote, common good capitalism is about a vibrant and growing free market, but it is also about harnessing and channeling that growth for the benefit of our country, our people, and our society at large, unquote. So how does Rubio propose that we harness this growth? And should Catholic social teaching be used as a guidebook for policy? Acton's co-founder and president, Reverend Robert Sirico, joins the show to break it down. Don't forget that, as always, I've linked all the relevant articles for you in the show notes. And you can read them at blog.acton.org. That's blog.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, and I'm the librarian and a research associate at the Acton Institute. I'm joined today by Father Robert Sirico, president and co-founder of the Acton Institute. Today, we'll be discussing Catholic social teaching in general, some of Senator Marco Rubio's thoughts on its importance for many of the challenges we face today, as well as some of the criticisms from both the political left and right of some of Senator Rubio's proposals. Father Robert, welcome to Acton Line. Great to be back, of course. Thank you. I th- I think the best place to begin is is to sort of talk about what Catholic social teaching is and why it's important today. Well, uh, <laughs> that's a very big question, yeah. really. But let, let me just kind of give a few markers to kind of set the, the backdrop. Uh, modern Catholic social teaching begins with uh, Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum, which um, is written in the light of the new things, that's what rerum novarum means, the new things that were happening with the Industrial Revolution. The advent of communism, the real intent of um, Leo was to protect the working class from the lure of communism. So all of that was going on at the time. Um, Of course, Christianity has always had a social teaching because uh, Christ was incarnate. (laughs) The world is important. Uh, Human beings are social and individual entities. So uh, this is a a kind of modern application of an ancient insight. Uh, And then you go for roughly 100 years. The the bookend encyclicals are Rerum Novarum by Leo XIII and Centes Mosanos by St. John Paul II. Uh, St. John Paul is looking at a new world also. He intentionally represents uh, Leo XIII and updates Leo XIII. That's what he says he's going to do in that encyclical. And he takes account of the fall of communism and what economic systems work best that protect the values of the church. The core of the social teaching of the church is the human person. It might be said that in Catholic social understanding uh, and with regard to markets, that the human person is the source and the summit, that the human person has to be at the center of economics because that is what economics is. It's human beings making decisions. It's not abstractions, uh, but human beings. And it has to be the summit, the, the, the real litmus test of Uh, any moral society is how does it treat the most vulnerable? How does it treat human beings? And so that's the frame of reference that we're dealing with. Here's one caveat, and that is that Catholic social teaching is not a set of public policy proposals. It's not a political platform. It's a set of principles, and it is dynamic. It's not static. It's not one doctrine like the Holy Trinity that's irreformable. Uh, It is uh, a set of principles that is in constant interaction with the contingent realities of any given society, any place in the world. So 
it frustrates people in one sense that you don't have these Ten Commandments of, you know, what policy things uh, are moral and what are immoral. And on the other hand, it's vague enough in the sense that it's not a policy proposal that you can get a lot of distortions. It leaves a lot of room for prudent disagreement among people who are faithful and inspired by Catholic social teaching. So that's kind of the backdrop for it. And, you know, the, and those principles get to the heart of the nature of the human person and community. And it makes sense that somebody like Senator Rubio yes. would turn to them. He's been speaking quite a lot about Catholic social teaching in outlets like First Things Magazine. He had an address at the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America on what he calls uh, common good capitalism and the dignity of work. And these discussions lean heavily on Pope Leo XIII's encyclical that you mentioned, uh, Rerum Novarum, where he used that as a framework for thinking through our economic life and as a guide to public policy. Let's begin talking about Senator Rubio's reading of Catholic social teaching. What do you think of his reading of it? And is he right to put the dignity of work and the common good at the center of his discussion? Well, let me say that I am glad that any public official will engage Catholic social teaching, beginning, of course, with Leo XIII. Um, I don't think that he has elaborated very much. He's said a few things, and I think there are prudential questions that can be raised, and I, I want to raise them in the course of our discussion here. But my first uh, reaction is to say that this is a good development that he's grappling with these things. Yes, of course, human dignity and the nature of work have to be at the center of it because that's the center of any economic uh, system. Uh, so, yes, all of that is welcomed and it's good. I um, And here I'm going into a bit of the critique, but I'll elaborate that yeah. if you provoke me properly. No, no. Uh, and I, I just wish he had taken into consideration also centesimus annus. I, I, I don't think there's a single citation from centesimus. Well, maybe there is one. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he refers to Benedict and he refers to Pope Francis as well. But I don't think those are in depth. And I'll, I'll offer some yeah. direct critiques. Yeah, because the, the interest and the engagement is welcome. These are yes. rich sources. Right. Um, we've we've done work. We uh, put on an edition of a, a, a small anthology called The Makers of Modern Christian Social Thought that includes yeah. Rerum Novarum, along with um, an essay at a contemporary time and place of Abraham Kuyper, struggling through a lot of those same issues through through the lens of Protestant social thought. That, that by the way, is a good point uh, to emphasize that really, especially in our day and age, we need to see this as Christian social thought, that these principles are applicable without regard to uh, uh, denominational affiliation. The, the second part of, of sort of Senator Rubio's argument is his analysis of the contemporary economic condition, particularly in the United States. Uh, and it's sort of for him a creation and fall story, um, that in the past we had this economic life that was essentially compatible with the common good and the dignity of work. And then at some point, American institutions, particularly he singles out large transnational corporations, became solely fixated on profits at the expense of both. And he points to the increasing financialization of the economy, reduced manufacturing employment, population losses in rural communities, and the deterioration of family life and a lack of sort of technological innovation as, as symptoms of these problems. What, what do you think of that, of that economic analysis? Well, I, I think it is superficial. Uh, for instance... He has a beautiful description of his family life. You know, his father had yes. come from uh, Cuba and their life, the fact that their family was able to support four children, send them through school on um, modest salaries. I think he said his mother was a maid and his father was a, a worker. And then he jumps to the modern era. And he talks about this hyper-financialization of the economy. And yet, we, we are where we were in terms of that question uh, from an economic point of view. What he doesn't touch on, and, and it's strange that he doesn't bring this into the analysis because it is the uh, foundation of his concern and critique, 
And that is, what else has happened in that period of time? What you've seen happen are two, two major things, and they are uh, interrelated, but, but not uh, one produce the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is the economic sector of our society is far more dominated, both in terms of regulation and in terms of taxation, by the federal government, more than it has ever been, certainly in the last 40 and 50 years that he's describing. And the second is a monumental cultural revolution that has gone hand in hand with that, uh, that has denigrated the importance of women's work in the home and the stability of the family and uh, other moral norms that he is concerned about. And to not bring those two realities into this analysis leaves the analysis, I think, superficial. I think the other part of um, a number of the assumptions that he makes, uh, and it's almost as though he's oblivious to this, is when he says, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and then he has a number of proposals. And the question is, who needs to do this? Who needs to see that we need more of this or that in a given sector of the economy? And of course, his presumption is that the state needs to do that. And my contention is that this is going to exacerbate the very problem that he wants to remedy, especially for someone so concerned about um, Catholic social teaching and Leo XIII to not bring into play um, the question of subsidiarity in his whole analysis is another lacuna that that uh, needs to be addressed. And there's there's also an understanding of human needs that Senator Rubio has that seems fixed, that, that his parents' experience should in some way be normative, that the way our economy is structured should be the way it was structured in the 1950s right. and the 1960s. And economies are dynamic living things, right. and they're the creations of the choices of individual human persons. Yeah, they're they're dynamic living things because human beings are yes. dynamic living things, and they, they come upon more needs mm-hmm. that they realize that they have, and there are new innovations that uh, impact the way people live. And so, of course, the economy is not going to be the same thing as it was in the 50s. In, in light of this economic analysis, Senator Rubio has this to say uh, – Quote, the old way simply will not do. The notion that left unguided, the market will solve our problems, will restore a balance between the obligations and rights of the private sector and working Americans. It may lead to GDP growth and record profits, but economic growth and record profits will not, on their own, lead to the creation of a dignified work. Is this, is this a fair characterization of our recent public policy. <laughs> well, it's certainly not a fair – no, it's certainly not that. But, but here's, here's the question. What does that? Mm-hmm. What, what brings about an appreciation of the dignity of work? What brings about the appreciation of a dignity of life? Uh, and if what he's saying is that public policy is what does that, then this uh, gets me nervous because I think that's the root of – much of the problem that, that we're dealing with here. In a sense, the senator is, is far more economistic in his analysis. In other words, he thinks the economy is the core of the culture. I don't doubt that economy can affect culture. But if he sees the solution to the cultural problem as fundamentally an economic problem, mm-hmm. then I think this is where he's missing the, the mark. Work is, is more than a series of inputs and outputs. It's more than a way of getting and spending. It's, it's an orientation of service to others. Right. Um, now, and, that, and that comes from a certain moral formation that in the past was provided to a very great extent by the family and by the strong institutions of the church. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, in the social sphere and the social services that were delivered in the schools that were operated by religious uh, organizations and all of these other things that recognized and instantiated what Kuiper called sphere sovereignty, what... Leo and other popes would call subsidiarity. That is, 
the normative actors in society are people themselves in family and non-state institutions, and that that should be the first response to human need and social organization. In this very period of time that he's describing, that has been put on its head. Now the state is the first actor. And the implications of what the senator is saying in his speech and in his article is precisely that, that mm -hmm. if we're going to remedy these things, and how are we going to do it? We're going to do it through the lens of the state. Senator Rubio has proposed a series of public policy initiatives, and some of them are things like taxing uh, stock buybacks, encouraging what he calls physical investment, building hubs of manufacturing and innovation, and, and further expanding the per-child tax credit, paid family leave. Um, but many on the left have been critical of Senator Rubio for not going far enough. Uh, Stephen Milley's associate professor of public theology and director of the Bernardine Center at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago feels that a wholesale rejection of capitalism is necessary. And this is to quote him. Uh, Catholic theorists of distributivism, for example, proposed an entirely different model that seeks no jury rigging or awkward contortions to fit Catholic social teaching because it does what Pope Leo uh, XIII, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis did, but which neither Rubio nor, nor most American Catholics are able to do, begin by abandoning capitalism. Is capitalism incompatible with Catholic well, social well, teaching? Well, first of all, uh, Professor Miller obviously is not reading either Leo or John Paul II because mm -hmm. neither of them are abandoning capitalism. They are both trying to bring a moral uh, sensitivity to market activity just the way we want to bring a moral sensitivity to all human uh, engagement. Uh, John Paul in particular, who has the advantage of having now seen a century of experimentation with socialist uh, and communist uh, uh, policies explicitly says in Centesimus Anos that it is the free market that should be recommended to those coming out from under the wreck of socialism, of real socialism. So Professor Miller is just simply mistaken mm -hmm. or truncated in his view of what Catholic social teaching is. But no, uh, I, I think that if we're going to solve the problem of poverty, we have to have uh, organizations, uh, that is to say businesses, that are making profits. And this fixation, uh, this we see not only in Senator Rubio's uh, analysis, but I think in the tradition he's uh, dipping his toe into, the small is beautiful uh, movement, seems to be fixated on the size of the thing. But if you have uh, six or seven billion people on the planet, you obviously need large-scale production in order to sustain uh, a population. If these folks got their way, you would have massive starvation mm -hmm. uh, because you wouldn't be able to produce the kinds of goods and services that, and food that, that people need. One, one other comment on, on – uh Professor Miller's point is, uh, and going back to John Paul II, again, is another encyclical on social concern. Um, he explicitly states that, quote, the church's social doctrine is not a third way between liberal capitalism and Marxist collectivism, nor even a possible alternative to other solutions re less radically opposed to an one another. Rather, it constitutes a category of its own. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's exactly the point, that, that what it is, I, I, uh, you know, I've said this before, but it's worth uh, repeating in this context. Uh, I don't like the word capitalism. John Paul didn't like the yes. word capitalism. Uh, he preferred to call it a business economy or a market economy or a private economy. Uh, and what is this radical alternative, a category of its own? It's the free and virtuous society that, that Acton has talked about. It's not an ideological capitalism that has a priori assumptions with regard to profit and loss and all the rest of it. It certainly isn't a collectivism that denigrates the dignity of the human person and sees the human being only as a, a cog in, in this greater uh, economic process. It, it is the recognition of human dignity and the part of that human dignity is expressed 
in the free economic uh, sphere where people make decisions based upon their needs, the needs of their families, and are able to acquire uh, profits and retain the lion's share of what they produce rather than having it devoured by a rapacious state. And there have also been been critics on the right, of course, um, and one of the most outspoken is the always outspoken uh, Calvin Williamson of the National Review. He wrote a wrote a piece, uh, and he claims that common good, uh, that Senator Rubio's common good capitalism is not any different from Senator Elizabeth Warren's conception of accountable capitalism, and that they both. Uh, and ignore fundamental realities of economics. Um, and this is just to quote him, uh, quote, it is the case that resources are limited, scarcity is an inescapable fact, and that firms and workers compete with one another, as do consumers. Politicians never talk about that for some reason. And what to make of that? Nothing. Senator Rubio simply proceeds with his shallow moralizing as though these facts were not facts, unquote. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I'd be hard-pressed to disagree with uh, mm-hmm. what he says there. Um, I, I think Rubio's proposals are far more modest yes. than, uh, than Senator Warren's, but I think they're on the same path. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know how Rubio, in a principled way, would block the progression that Warren seems to advocate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there being no third way, this is hardly a creative um, proposal uh, that's innovative and new. Uh, mm-hmm. I think if you if you sap these mediating institutions of their moral influence in society, as these kinds of economic policies do, both in terms of the workplace and what kind of atmosphere you can create in the workplace, for instance, in the name of social justice and and all of the woke capitalism, if you do that and if you defend policies or the principles that end up becoming policies, then you can't very well complain about the result of it. Yeah. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I think, I think it is true that neither Warren nor Rubio are looking at the economic reality of scarcity. With, with that in mind, what do you think is, is, is the ideal approach when we're, when we're thinking about these relationships between economic science, Catholic social teaching, and public policy? What, what should that interaction look like? For, for policymakers um, and for us as citizens too, evaluating these sorts of proposals. Well, I think the first thing that that needs to happen is a mutual respect uh, mm-hmm. that that you really have to uh, speak to one another charitably and intelligently. Um, and I don't think that's done very much in general in the in the common parlance of our of our day. Uh, it's usually very ad hominem. I think people don't speak uh, outside of their own comfortable ideological camps. That's why I'd, I'd open this podcast up to Senator Rubio or Senator Warren, for that matter, to come and sit and have a conversation about these issues. Uh, so I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it is we have to be committed uh, to the truth and where the truth leads us. Uh, we're a rational um, analysis of of the uh, pressing mm-hmm. needs of our society, um, what what we're confronted with, and looking at those things. Yeah, um, I think that's part of the way there. Yeah, a, a good grasp of economics doesn't doesn't hurt either. The problem is that you know the old saying that to a hammer everything is a nail. And I think to a politician, and this is one of the the drawbacks of politicians entering this, to a politician, everything is a policy. And I don't think that's it. I think these policies are the very uh, agencies, uh, depending on the policy, of course, uh, are the very means by which we erode uh, the fabric of society that Senator Rubio wants. The, the, the kind of notion of a family that can function together and take responsibility for themselves and their and their uh, extended families. You, I mean, you've written and spoken extensively about 
Catholic social teaching and economics. Um, you co-edited a wonderful volume titled uh, The Social Agenda, a collection of magisterial texts, which was put out by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace back in 2000. Yes. It's nice. It's arranged topically. It goes through all sorts of family, community, uh, the nature of Catholic social teaching, some of these economic questions, private property, with just the with just excerpts and readings yeah, from no commentary, these just just the texts. Um, what other resources would you recommend to listeners to get a deeper understanding and appreciation of Catholic social teaching beyond just as sort of a template for for a public policy checklist to sort of fully— Well, of course, there's the Acton Institute mm-hmm. uh, uh, bookshop and the website, which, uh, uh, you know, is— is really an incredible resource for for a lot of different, um, not just Catholic social teaching, but mm-hmm. the grappling of uh, you know moral engagement with um, with economics. Uh, the co-editor of that volume that was published by the Vatican in two thousand that you mentioned, his name is Maciej Zemba. Mm-hmm. Uh, he at that time was the provincial of all of the Dominicans in Poland. Uh, close collaborator with John Paul II, has written a book called Catholic Economics. Mm-hmm. And I would recommend that book. Is that um, – I think ISI puts that out under the title uh, Papal Economics. I'm sorry, Papal okay. Economics. Papal yeah. Economics, yes. Uh, and um, uh, I think also uh, most anything written by Sam Gregg. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a book that doesn't deal specifically with Catholic. It's certainly informed by Catholic social teaching. Um, uh, my book, uh, Defending the Free Market, The Moral Case for a Free Economy. And I have a small book called Catholicism's Developing Social Teaching, which was written just as Chintes Mosanos came out, and that might be helpful in this regard as well. If you go on Acton website, you're going to see a whole list of uh, monographs uh, dealing with specific topics under this uh, heading. Well, Father Robert, thank you so much for joining us today on Acton Line. And I thought I thought it might be might be good to close with a uh, with a quotation from Pope Saint uh, John the Twenty Third. Um, from his encyclical uh, Mater et Magistra, where he talks, uh, and I'll just quote this with a quote, difference of opinion in the application of principles can sometimes arise even among sincere Catholics. When this happens, they should be careful not to lose their respect and esteem for each other. Instead, they should strive to find points of agreement for effective and suitable action and not wear themselves out in interminable arguments or under the pretext of the better or the best omit to do the good that is possible and therefore obligatory. Isn't that, isn't that refreshing? What, what a prescient uh, set of ideas. Yeah. So the discussion is welcome. Yes. And energizing. And, uh, and thank you again so much for being with us. Always a delight. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. If you like this episode, please share with friends and family and leave a rating and review in the Apple Podcast app. To learn more about the Acton Institute and what we do, visit our website at acton.org. This episode is produced and edited by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Joel Rittering. 